Hello, and welcome to Ask an Archaeologist. I'm Paul Duncan McGarrity. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Ask an Archaeologist with me, Paul Duncan McGarrity. And this episode, I'm talking to Natalie Cohen, the uh, resident archaeologist or cathedral archaeologist at Canterbury Cathedral, amongst many, many other things. Um, we were up a bit against a little bit of a, uh, uh, a squeeze on time. She managed to fit me into a very busy schedule, and we're very gra- grateful for that. Uh, so it's a slightly shorter interview than usual. But uh, hopefully you still enjoy it. It does sound like it was recorded in a cave. Uh, It was recorded in a very large room. So I'll do my best to try and fiddle around with the sound as well and make sure that you can all hear it because it is a very interesting interview. Um, What what can I say? Oh, goodness. It's been a busy old month for me at the moment. Um, Working on an away job. Can't say much about it uh, other than it's a cemetery site. Very interesting 19th century stuff, but it's keeping me away from the house quite a lot. Um, working three days out of five up there. Interesting stuff, but uh, nah, it's fine. Oh, oh, it's the nature of the beast, isn't it? Away work every now and again. Uh, <laughs> the thing about archaeology is you can't bring it home necessarily to do. You know, It's harder to work from home when you actually need to be there with people who are, who are digging the holes. Um it's you know it's slightly easier for me considering I work in the community engagement side of things, but uh, the look communities, the ones that you want to talk to, the ones you want to reach with these sites, are by their very nature local to the sites. So sometimes you just gotta fill up your bindle with uh, simulated digs for children and fact sheets and feedback forms. And uh, it's ever so slightly less romantic or adventurous than uh, than so maybe Huckleberry Finn with his polka dot one slung over his shoulder. But uh, you know, there I go. I, I sometimes you just go suck it up. It's not forever, and shoot off to uh, to deal with the site. Uh, although next uh, episode, uh, I'm talking to Casey Martinstone, an Australian archaeologist who takes helicopter lifts to reach the very uh, remote sites that she investigates. So maybe a little bit of moaning from me from the fact that I have to get up a little bit early to use a train is probably unwarranted. Uh, had a had a nice weekend. Anyone who came to see me in McCunthleth, I know there was at least one of you who listens to the podcast who, uh, who came to see the show uh, at the McCunthleth Festival. Thank you very much for coming to see it and uh, doubly thank you for making yourself known because um well it's a massive ego boost and really exciting Dead. i mean there's no two ways about it i just really enjoy meeting people um who listen to the podcast and who have an interest in archaeology and weirdly as well i did a a second gig in a gin distillery like away from the rest of the festival and three people at that had seen me at QED Festival, the the, the skeptics group. Um, and considering I wasn't listed as one of the uh, one of the performers on the Gin Show, it must. It, I mean, I was a shock to them, but you know, they were you know they were a shock to me, and I was a shock to them. So that was everyone was confused by the opening of that particular one. It's good. So I'll answer a couple of questions off Twitter just before we get started, because like I say, it's a little bit of a shorter one, so um, we'll do sort of a mini question and answer just at the top. Uh, Son of Gav off Twitter asks, is there any particular country you'd like to survey for archaeological purposes? Um, There's big bits of this one I'd still like to get my hands on, to be honest. Uh, I'm not sure that there's been one done. I've got two areas that I think I might be interested in looking at. Um, <laughs> add it to my long list of projects that I'd like to undertake. Uh, I'd like to look at the development of performance spaces in Britain, and specifically those that are of a temporary nature. 
I think that's a really interesting question to to, to really, really look at because there's a lot written and understood about how theatres and you know, cinemas, uh, opera houses, all of those buildings, how they have been designed to support the art form that's being undertaken in them. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot from architects and buildings archaeologists who understand how all that works. But I think a slightly more interesting question are the spaces that have been co-opted to perform uh, the role of theatre or a stage and, and so on. Um, because I think they have an incredibly huge impact on, on the development of uh, performance arts in uh around the world not just in the uk but i think they have a huge impact on them um just looking at my own art form do stand-up comedy stand-up comedy has purpose-built venues like the comedy store and uh the frog and bucket in manchester they're all following sort of like a, a layout on a design aided at helping the performance work to its heart and greatest potential but the truth of the matter is most of the venues are places like rooms above pubs, room un- underneath pubs, uh, gin distilleries, as I already said. You know, these, these spaces that are not designed to help an audience focus and enjoy themselves and, and not designed to help a performer uh, find a, a proper conduit for their art. And instead, those are the places where you will find most uh, bands and uh, maybe even small theatre pieces, definitely comedians learning their trade. So the impact those rooms have on art in this country, performance art in this country, I think is an underrated principle. It, it, it crosses over into something that's been looked at for Elizabethan playhouses and the idea of proper, you know, a proper space for performance. There's there's a strange kind of like um, occasionally a, a demarcation between uh, the playhouses, the ones that were built specifically for the actors, to the actors' specifications and, and, and designs, and those buildings that were maybe like courted, uh, uh, um, sort of coaching inns with courtyards in which stages were put up and performances were made. And the space was altered to allow performance to take place. Um, so yeah, I think that's I think that's a, a question I would like to maybe look into if I ever find time. Um, the other thing is, like coming from Middlesbrough, I don't know if anyone's done this, but I'd like I'd love to go and map out all the uh, the bits and bobs that are related to the mining industry up there. Just go and do a walkover survey and see if we can uh, clock where all of the the paths and huts and ins and outs of the mines were um I, you know it's a, it's an area that i uh, hung around a lot as a kid doing various uh walks and such um oh i've got another question as well uh from my wife who said I, she wanted me to, to answer this one on the podcast she wanted to know what the smallest listed building in the uk was uh, and i found out that it is a duck house um which is very interesting indeed. Uh, I thought it would be like um, some sort of like, sh- you know, uh, a shed of some kind or something like that. There's, there's a smallest listed building in London is Ostler's Hut in Lincoln's Inn. Uh, oh, sorry, the Ostler's Hut in Lincoln's Inn uh, down in Westminster. And so I thought it would be something uh, along those lines. But no, it's this duck house. On to the interview, I think. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, as I say, Nat Cohn has got... Uh, she's one of those people who just seems to have energy for days and, and so many different projects going on all at once. Uh, we didn't even get to cover things like the D, uh, TDP, which is Thames Discovery Programme she's involved with as well. Um, so I'm going to try and hunt someone else down to talk about that. But in the meantime, I know uh, Nat wanted to get on to discussing it. So if you take a moment, Google that, it, you'll realise just how many strings to a bow she has. Um, yeah, that's pretty much everything for this month. Remember to rate, uh, review, subscribe, tell friends, uh, send questions through on Ask an Arc, and I will catch you next time. Uh, bye bye.
starting it, just sort of like, <laughs> coming from beyond the grave. <laughs> but unfortunately, no, it's just a, the big room we could find. The big room that was free for us to use. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, thank you very much for doing the interview. I know we're against the clock a little yeah, bit. Yeah, sorry. No, don't worry. Traffic. We, do not apologize for that. Um, basically, we I've been trying to pin you down for a very long time. Sorry. No, again, don't apologize. Uh, I think it might be a reflection of why... I think it would be a really interesting interview for podcast, um, because to get it started, do you know how you were first introduced to me? No. It, the first time anyone went, oh, that's Nat Cohen, they said, uh, oh, that's Nat Cohen. She's the woman who runs the cathedrals. <laughs> and I was like... That's technically not true. I know, but isn't that a lovely way to be told? <laughs> it, it is. It's not, as introductions go, it's not, a, it's not a bad one. It's not a bad one. So, for more clarity, what exactly is it? What are the, the many roles that you fulfil? So, so, I currently have two mm -hmm. uh, jobs. So, I work for the National Trust. I'm a regional archaeologist. So, I cover Kent and East Sussex. And I also work for Canterbury Cathedral. So, I'm their cathedral archaeologist. Right, and that's probably what they were referring to. Probably, yeah. Did you, how, you were also responsible for some other buildings as well. So I was, it. before I was at Canterbury, I was Southwark Cathedral's archaeologist. Yeah, so. And that's where the cathedral's plural comes from. <laughs> yes, I didn't, I've never worked on them both at the same time. Like, so <laughs> right. I moved from one to the other. So, All um, right, so it's kind of like more like a, a building legend as you go through. Yeah. <laughs> I like that as well, a building legend. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so as part of my work at the National Trust, well, we don't have any cathedrals. We do have big country houses, which mm. you are familiar with. Yes. Uh, so that's the, I, I tend to um, seem to end up working uh, with projects that are at some scale and um, places that are yes. large. Like no, for like example. Noel, yes. Um, is no the largest? Country I believe house? it is the largest country house in England. Right. Yes. So that is that's a sizable pile. It is a sizable pile. All right. So yes. what do you do with these buildings? What's what does the the archaeologist for a cathedral or a country house do? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, in both cases, I'm the the, the consultant archaeologist. So mm. I'm there to support and advise the property teams essentially who are running the organizations at those places with anything that they want to do that might impact their fabric or below ground mm. so if they want to put in a drain run if they want to put in a new car park if they want to put in welfare facilities phones whatever yes. anything that has an impact to the the, the landscape the fabric it, it's something that i help to advise on yeah um, so with big projects or big places like that, it means it's a fantastic opportunity to work with loads of people because if it's a small job, like some post holes, I can do it myself. Yeah. But if it's a big multi-million pound project, then we get the opportunity to work with lots of different specialists across lots of different areas. That's brilliant. Is it something you always wanted to get into? Uh, archaeology is, yeah. I mean, if I'd been yeah. thinking about you know an ambition, then I, I would have never have thought that I'd be working somewhere like Canterbury Cathedral. That's, yeah. a, that's an amazing uh, point to have reached in, in one's career. But yeah, I always wanted to be an archaeologist since yeah. I was about 10. So how, let's find out how you ended up at Canterbury Cathedral. Okay. When was, do you think you can remember if there was any particular inciting incident that made you want to do archaeology or was it kind of like uh, a, a growing feeling? I'm probably one of those terribly cliched people who goes Indiana Jones. But... <laughs> To be fair, Indiana Jones was quite a big formative experience, yeah. just because I don't think I realised until I saw that movie mm. that you could have a job that was about history, not that he's a great archaeologist and all of those things. No, no, no. His methodologies I mean, are this. terrible, all Until, of that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Until we I, do the Indiana Jones and supervising the drain run at exactly. Canterbury Cathedral. <laughs> and the, the, the very small mitigated test pit. Um, <laughs> the, Indiana Jones in the watching brief. Exactly. Super exciting stuff. <laughs> Cable trench. Yeah, it drops um, his hat into the trench. Yeah, that is the most exciting thing that's going to happen to him all day, let's face it. <laughs> um, I don't think I realised until then that you could have a, a job, because I always loved history, but yeah. I thought, well, if I want to do something to do with history, I'm going to have to be sat in the library, which I also like. Mm. Um, but archaeology, you get to go out and you get to find stuff and you get to talk to people and you get to learn things and you learn something different every day and there's always something more that you can learn. Right. But I suppose it was, although it sounds really cliched, Indiana Jones gave me a kind of a, yeah. a, a way in and then I, my family are uh, um, 
when we moved from Australia, one of the things that my parents really liked to do of a weekend was go and visit big castle yeah. landscapes and country houses and all those sorts of things. So it was very much... It was sort of like it was always there, yeah. it was surrounding you, and then eventually yeah. you were like, I can do that. I can do this. Yeah. yeah. So um, did you do anything prior to going off to you? Or did you study archaeology at university? I did. Uh, yeah. So I went to university and did uh, medieval archaeology because mm. I was always really interested in, in that period. Um, before I went to university, I did a training dig. Um, that was right. on a Roman villa. So was that the Sussex. first time that you went the out? first time. You are yeah. like, all right, where are the Nazis? Uh, we were digging, if I remember correctly, what was part of the car park. There was villa underneath it, but you had to get through the car park to get to it. So yeah. it was at that point that, um, I mean, Romans are not necessarily for me. They're lots of kind of straight edges and right angles and corners, and, and I find them a little... You find them boring because of straight edges. A little, a little bit. If you... Villas are all on a plan. I know lots of things are on a plan. Romans are not my, uh, they're not my passion. No, so, but that's um, the joy of the industry. Yeah, so yeah. you learn, don't you, as you go through and you dig on different sites and you work in different places and you, and you try different things and within our, within the very broad church that is archaeology, you find... And you find out you like broad yeah. churches. Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did start off with a main focus looking at um, parish churches. That was my particular oh. interest at university. That's my dissertation was on parish churches. What was it churches. about parish churches that you found interesting? Uh, it's, it's, that in, it's that very much kind of communal expression of faith and the fact that their context in the kind of village setting and yeah. the, the changes to those buildings that happen over hundreds of years growing and contracting and <laughs> yeah, yeah, really those sort of things. I always find it fascinating that if you look at an English village, the two buildings that tend to be the oldest are the, the church and the pub. The pub. <laughs> yeah, basically. It's like, what has this society been built? Oh, okay, we've got yeah. it. <laughs> Yeah, but pub archaeology would be another good one. I always think that would be a branch that would be very interesting to come into. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got your hostelry and your amenities all in one, and some, like you say, some fantastic really early buildings as well. Mm, that's cool. Um, so maybe when I'm retired. <laughs> maybe when you're retired. You, oh, that's a lovely retirement excuse. I have to go to another pub this weekend. Yeah, it's, it's for research. Yeah. <laughs> I'm you're not really retired, you're still working. Quite a lot of the barrels. <laughs> All the gyms in the southeast of England clearly need to be supplemented. Anyway. Exactly. Um, so, what were you doing in your dissertation? What was I mean? You've come to it. Was you were you were doing medieval archaeology? Were yeah. you thinking you were going to do below ground, or was there something about standing buildings that appealed? Um, it was. I was at UCL, so we we had to do seventy our seventy days of field work, mm. and I was really lucky to be at UCL at a period of time when. There was a lot of medieval archaeology going on, so people like Andrew Reynolds and Gus Milne, and they were both running projects um, that involved excavation and building recording, and particularly obviously with Gus building recording in London, and Mm. that's what I looked at for my undergraduate dissertation. So I did um, an archive research project uh, looking at the records of bomb-damaged churches and earlier excavations of parish churches, and so did a catalogue and went around and looked at all the churches and tried to look at phasing of how those buildings changed over time. Oh, that's really cool. It was a really lovely project. It's still a fantastic, it would still be, there is still a massive research project to be done on There's still more. London churches that no <laughs> one's done yet, so, you know, hint out to anyone who's interested, but that would be, you know, they're, they're a great uh, resource, those churches, yeah. they're really interesting. So. That's fantastic. Very cool. So you finish it up at UCL. Finish you've now UCL. found that you've got a, uh, you know, you found an interest. You've got away from the straight walls. Yes. You're into the wonky walls. Yes. What happens next? I work as a receptionist. <laughs> yeah. Was it a receptionist in a church? Uh, no, it was oh. for the Institute of Archaeology. <laughs> <laughs> right, fair enough. So yeah, I, um, I, I knew I wanted to stay in London, and I applied, but I, but I was prepared to go anywhere, and mm. I applied to a lot of units for digging. Yeah. There were no jobs in. 1994. All um, right. It was extremely hard to get any digging without even, you know, you had to have considerably more than your 70 days or 100 days uh, fieldwork experience. Yeah. So I took the job at UCL because I needed a job and staying in London was a really good um, move for me at that mm. stage. So I sat behind the reception desk and answered the phone and we didn't have email if I remember correctly. Or did it come in right at the end? I sorted a lot of post. I was responsible for opening the building in the yeah. morning. I was responsible for fixing the photocopier. That's an experience that stayed with me for a really long time. Um, yeah. Was there much sort of like lecture wrangling in that 
reception. Um, the idea of the receptionist, well, it was, it was manifold. So I was a receptionist and I was the undergraduate admissions secretary as well. So there was quite a lot of contact with the lecturers. And as part of my role as a receptionist, you were meant to kind of know where everyone was. So mm. you were meant to have a kind of overview of <laughs> everyone's diary, essentially, in the kind of lectures yeah. program. So that you, if someone came in and said, I'm looking for such and such, you were meant to be able to say, Oh, try yeah. them in their office, and then if they came back and said, I'm not, they're not there, you were meant to be able to know where they were. <laughs> Which sometimes worked and sometimes did. I was going to say, are you sending them to their office so you can check their diary while they're yeah. all... <laughs> I know they're not in, but where are they? The first port of call is always, surely they're in their office, surely. <laughs> no, never. In their office. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was, it, was, it was a really good... I, I really enjoyed it. I'm quite, it turned out that I didn't really like answering telephones before that, and that cured me of my slight issue with answering telephones, because obviously you had to. Yeah. Um, I'm quite a sociable, so it was quite it's quite a nice place to sit in reception because obviously everyone passes me by and because I'd only just left the university, yeah. all my mates were still there. And they all know you. <laughs> and they're like yeah. and it was Are you yeah, do yeah. you know you can leave? <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. But it was it, I sort of extended my university experience for a, for yeah, a yeah. year. Um, and oh, but so I was you, working. You were there for a year doing I think that. it was a year or just under a year. I think I left just before the summer holidays maybe. Mm. The year following, because I had some, I got some digging work over in the Czech Republic, so I went to the Czech Republic for yeah. six weeks. And that, did that well. come through contacts that you'd made whilst you were staying in the reception, or was it just it gave you the opportunity to look at the same time? Um, it was sort of part of being at UCL, I think, because there, there was always because it's quite a, a global university. They, mm. There were always opportunities if people wanted to go and dig overseas. So actually, I was. In my undergraduate, I was most I dug almost entirely in Britain, mm. but you couldn't. It, you know, most people were well, a lot of people were going to Belize or to North Africa or yeah. to France or to Ireland. There was a there was a real it was a really good place to learn about other yeah. places that you could go and dig overseas. So I thought I'd try and I applied to go and study mm. in Czechoslovakia. Yeah, I mean the fact that you only had that you have to do seventy days field work as part of that course, and yet people. When you come out, don't think you're as qualified to dig. Is that well? There was, a, if I remember correctly, we, it was another um, slump. There was a recession, so there was there wasn't any work. Right. Um, I don't think it was that necessarily people would have thought you were unqualified. You just didn't have enough experience. And I think there there is there is still a disparity between, or there certainly was at university between what you've learned at university, however much field work you've done, and mm going straight onto a, a commercial site, particularly in London, with very deep urban strat, all my digging experience up to then had been rural yeah. sites, had standing building experience in London, but there weren't particularly any jobs uh, in no. that at the time. No. So. Is it a more of a recent undertaking that archaeology has been recognised as the standing buildings thing? I would say so. When I first started working at MOLA, there was Andrew Westman who mm. did the standing buildings and he was the only person who mm. sort of specialised as a specialist role yeah. he was the only person who was that was his job title um, and that certainly changed over the years you know, there's been big teams of people yeah. who've worked with standing buildings archaeologists do you think there's any particular more uh, like driving factor that's changed there I think there's more work in it I think there's more of a recognition around uh, the historic environment that the built fabric is just as much archaeology as the stuff that's below the ground mm. and a, a broader spectrum of things as well that in the past might have been removed without recording yeah when I worked in standing buildings at Mola we were recording a huge range of things including things like you know multi-story car parks and factories and and you know, things that are comparatively recent that yeah. people might not have considered even archaeology, but obviously is archaeology. Yeah. So, so I think maybe that it's it's all about the evolution of the profession, I suppose. I was say, is it a change in the approach to it from archaeologists or from like the requirements? Because obviously, commercial archaeology has to fulfil certain planning obligations. Yeah, I think it's both actually. Both. I think it's. I think it's. I think the, the two have probably developed alongside each other. So as the planning conditions have tightened up, mm. there's more of a, a, a driver for people to specialise in and you know to be able to go to university and study yeah. standing buildings archaeology as a you know as a master's degree, like you could do at York or and the same sort of thing with community archaeology and public archaeology. All those kind of disciplines that are growing out of the work that we do mm. um, and are, are being recognised 
curatorial perspective and then it sort of helps to create better. One would hope. One would hope, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you're off to the Czech Republic, um, you're doing your excavations there. Uh, how long are you over for and, and um, what does it lead on to? So it's six weeks uh, mm. in the Czech Republic and in, on a site in Slovakia as well. Um, what were you excavating? Uh, in in Prague, we working we were working around the cathedral, which was uh, amazing. <laughs> Three cathedrals, yeah, right? You deny it at first. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, they were digging test pits, I think, around to put in uh, light wells, if I remember correctly. Um, and then in in Slovakia, we were digging what was supposed to be a Roman fort, but it turned out not to be. And, and yeah, it was it was oh. a very it, that was an interesting site, but there definitely wasn't anything Roman there. We we, we really looked. <laughs> right. How was um, that received? Um, it was it, it was a really interesting site to work on. It was it was led by someone that I'd been at university with, and we were an entirely uh, student group that went out, mm. a recent student group that went out to work there. And the community out there was amazing and really welcoming and really interested to know what we were finding. Yeah. Um, it was just a shame that we didn't really find that much to, <laughs> to, to yeah. Yeah, there was plenty of other stuff around. So they weren't like, week one, we're so glad you're here, <laughs> like week four. Yeah. Have you, you found can, it yet? You can leave now. There, it, was, it was quite a short, um, it was only a, a couple of weeks, I think, that one. So okay. um, yeah, we were made very welcome and it was just a shame that we couldn't kind of find what, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. what they thought was there. Hey, that's sometimes the case. You can't find the thing you're looking for. Yeah. That's, the, that's the wrong way around. It definitely wasn't that. <laughs> so. Cool. <laughs> So yeah, what did I do after that? Uh, I came back and I worked for a project, uh, an English heritage project called the Monuments at Risk Survey, um, which was based at Bournemouth University, but they had a national team of people who went out yeah. uh, looking for monuments at risk, essentially. To Just, be. So it, it, well, are they, when you say at risk, are we looking for environmental factors, human factors, what kind of thing? Everything. So they, um, it was a kind of state of the nation type survey. Yeah. Um, so the idea was you, they, they randomly generated with a very whizzy computer program in the late 1990s. A whole series of, uh, so a black screen with green letters. Pretty much. Uh, transects across the country. The, the transects could fall wherever. Um, right. And the, the job of the field surveyors, which I was one of in the East Midlands. Transects, you mean, is sort of like a, a strip a long, of land. A strip of so land. it was a, a one kilometre, uh, two kilometres by... I can't remember the exact time, which is actually two kilometres by half a kilometre sort of strip, yeah. rectangle that you had to go to the local record office and look up all the dots that fell in it. Ooh. So it could be anything. It could go through the middle of a city or it could go through a field. Right. <laughs> you had to go and find out if there was anything in your strip. Yeah. And then you had to go out and ground truth it and see if it was still there. So it was a really cool job. Ah, so essentially checking our records of what do we think we have yep. and then going... And then what's the condition it's in. Yeah, and someone, oh no, no, right back, someone walked off with that standing circle. Yeah, or, so. or someone's ploughed this field or there's a there's a housing development here. So sometimes it would flag up where the records hadn't been updated. So if there'd been development or a road or something yeah. that had gone through. Flagged up all kinds of interesting things as well. Like um, if you'd had a SMR, so it's a monuments person who was particularly interested in, say, canals. Yeah. In one particular area, that would you find that would be all you were looking at because <laughs> that was what was coming out. Was like so canals. many canals, but yeah, loads of canals, loads of dovecotes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of loads of dovecotes, loads of canals. But you're looking over here and you're like, and yeah. this church it's isn't on. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was it was it was a really interesting job to do because you mm. we, we covered Lincolnshire, uh, Leicestershire, and Nottinghamshire was yeah. our kind of area. So a lot of driving and a lot of kind of yeah. knocking on people's doors as well and, and saying, is it all right if we come and look at? You know, your garden or your field, or yeah, yeah. Uh, wow, very interesting. That was just a few months that job, um, okay. And then I came back to work in London. Why was it only a few months? Was it just oh, it's, it the, was, the project was a few months? Or I came, it was quite close to the end of the project, and I, I had a job offer that was that I'd kind of um, postponed to do that one, but I needed to start it after Christmas, yeah. So, um, my partner at the time took over my role on the Monuments at Risk survey and, and yeah. I went to start in London. So. Oh, that's really cool. Um, so, just to, we'll, we'll finish up very quickly because I, I want to move on, but um, did it throw up anything interesting, any patterns from the project or were you not um, like, aware of that? It was quite a random, because it was randomly generated mm. what you were looking at, the, the patterns I think came out um, through other people's work when they were actually crunching all that data. Yeah. Um, and they did write a report that enabled some sort of overviews of 
you know, these kinds of monuments are being lost to this kind of erosion. So yeah. know, coastal erosion, obviously, um, agricultural erosion, mm. urban expansion. So the big picture sort of stuff was yeah. pulled out um, by another group of people at Bournemouth University. Who was, that was their job to pull yeah. out all the stuff. Um, so you come back to Mola, is that standing building? Uh, no, I was actually at the Main Museum of London. Oh! Um, uh, so I, yeah, right. so I worked as a research assistant at the Museum of London for yeah. a couple of years. Worked on a, an archive, uh, the Professor Grimes' archive. Oh yeah. And worked for Gus on the Thames Archaeological Survey and on standing buildings projects. Yes. So basically, whatever field work was available through working with you Gus, just I would whatever you could. go and do that. <laughs> um, and then I was, uh, we were... Uh, I was a research assistant on a project with Gus and uh, John Shepherd to mm. write up Professor Grimes' uh, archive, so we were working for English Heritage, essentially. Grimes was the guy who did a lot of excavations post-war, post-war. so every time there was a cleared bomb site, he'd be in. He He's the guy who found the Mithraeum, isn't he? That's the one. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so we would, So John was focusing on the Roman uh, archaeology, so the Mithraeum and the fort, and Gus was leading on the, the medieval archaeology, so we looked at the church excavations and some of the, the uh, livery halls and pub uh, sort of inns and markets. So. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, it's a really, really interesting, interesting job. I want to scoop forward a little bit. Because we're obviously, you've got some other things in there as well, but you, you end up working in the jobs that you have now. Yes. So, if we were to take Noel as an example, mm-hmm. uh, what sort of... Um, control over the projects and what kind of projects have you been involved with there recently? What do you mean by control? As in, so basically I'm asking what is your day-to-day kind of, because I realised I was going to say what's your day-to-day and then I realised <laughs> there is no normal day-to-day on that job. Not really, no. So um, Noel has been quite an unusual project because mm. obviously it's, it's a very, it's the, it was the biggest conservation project in the National Trust. Right. So my role there was sort of a project archaeologist to be the the point of contact for the project team, the property team, to sort of define what we were going to do around the archaeology and to work with all the engineers and the architects. Is it kind of like you translate from architect to archaeologist and archaeologist to architect? Essentially, yeah. I mean, in the same way that any project works, we, you know... I went into it saying, so we're going to take up every floorboard, right? And every bit of panel, we've got millions of panels. <laughs> um, but obviously it was it was mitigated through mm. the normal processes of, okay, well, we need to put a cable run here, so we'll be taking up this run of floorboards, mm. but we need to do fire compartmentation yeah. here, so that means all the panelling comes off. So, so what were they doing? Is it, was it kind of like they were trying to just update and improve the house without impacting too much on the historical fabric? Essentially. So the, the idea was to create... a uh, better environmental control for our collections. So that involved work to the exterior fabric, so work to the roof, uh, work to the eastern facade, and then work to the interior to install things like insulation, um, better lighting, better heating, fire right. compartmentation. So you can con- control the environment, so you, you've got the paintings yes. and all yes. of those sort the, of things. the internationally significant, all of that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. essentially <laughs> making the building a, a more, uh, uh, sorry, a, a less aggressive uh, place yeah. for, to keep them. Yes, and alongside that, um, all of the collections were conserved, so mm. that means that everything uh, went back into the showrooms in a yeah. better condition than it was in. Uh, with a more stable condition. Than and you're seeing fire compartmentalisation as well, so you're having to look at this stately home and add modern fire regulations to it as well. Yeah, so it, particularly with you know things like um, Clandon, the house in Surrey that, that had the terrible fire and obviously recent events at Notre Dame. Yeah. The idea, of, the idea of you know these big conservation projects is that you uh, aim to install as much of a kind of fire break. It's not going to stop it, but it will slow it. So yeah. There are points within the building where, if there was the worst the scenario, you would have a, a, a pause, hopefully, before it moves through the building. You can get people there. You can get people there. You can get you can get people out first yeah. and foremost, and then potentially you can also salvage um, collection items if it's yeah. safe to do so. And the fire it gives the fireman more a firefighter so more time to mm. stop it. Yeah. Hopefully. So whilst that project's happening, what kind of uh, research questions were you asking from uh, an archaeological point of view? So we were, we, at Noel we were very lucky because we started the project with um, 
there had been a, a two previous PhD projects undertaken by uh, Auden Gregory and Ed Town from the University of Sussex, and they had looked at the building mm. from the medieval period and from the 17th century to try and look at the documentary background and to also look at the fabric of the building. Oxford Archaeology similarly had looked at the, the fabric, but neither of those two uh, groups of people had had the opportunity to look uh, anything other than on the surface, if you like. So yeah. we were getting a look at, at the underneath, yeah. <laughs> but behind the panelling, under the floorboards, and that meant that we were able to test some of their ideas and hypothesis about how the building developed. So at its core, it is a, is a medieval manor house, and mm. we were able to get glimpses of that um, yeah. through Mola's recording work as well and try and understand a bit more about what we think is going on there. Uh, but it is such a vast building that it has literally raised as many questions as it's <laughs> answered, I think. You could say what was the most surprising thing that turned up? Uh, a message in a bottle from 1906, I think. Is oh, still that's pretty impressive. The most surprising thing, um, especially as someone who's worked in intertidal context for years and years and years, I've never found... <laughs> so you've always been hoping for that yep. stranded pirate and yep. instead you found... Never found one on the foreshore and then we're working with the volunteers in the attic spaces and, yeah. we, and we found this amazing message in a bottle left by um, uh, someone, an, a, someone who worked on the estate at Knoll. Yeah. He was very very keen to commemorate his time there, so he was also one of our most prolific graffitiers. So <laughs> we know a lot about Sid Doggett and you know, when he works Sid there. Sid Doggett. Sid Doggett, yeah. So his work actually goes, like, it, it, you know. It, it carries on. Yeah. 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 Well, not only that, it, it paid off. <laughs> all yeah, of, no, all we, we, we remember him. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so it, I think it was, but, a, it was a surprising thing to find, but also has yeah. been a really lovely discovery. It's one of, the, one of my favourites. Banksy so. of 1906. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, and Canterbury Cathedral, what sort of work's going on there? So Canterbury, similarly... Um, I, I've been working there about three years now, mm. and, and just as I started working there, they too started a very large conservation project, yeah. um, uh, Heritage Lottery funded again, um, that's called the Canterbury Journey, so similar to Knoll, they're doing a lot of external repair work, so uh, yeah. the whole of the nave roof has come off and gone back on again, uh, with fire compartmentation going Yay. The, the roof spaces. <laughs> they um, must be looking at Notre Dame thinking, brilliant, yeah, this is yeah, the right thing to do. Thinking we're, we're on the right lines, hopefully. It's certainly given everyone pause and, you know, had a, a, mm. a lot Does, of thinking through. Was that not being processes. conserved at the time? It was, yeah. So it, it was, it looked like, you know, the fire was in an area where people were working. So there must yeah. have been real concerns that everyone was actually off-site because yeah. that was a very scary-looking fire. That's so. the, I mean, does that come into your consideration as well of, like, looking at how, how the works are being done um, on the conservation side of things? There, there's That's part, partly. Mm. Um, I mean, there are other people at um, Canterbury and at um, the National Trust who that's their area of expertise. Yeah. So they would be the people who would be dealing with the kind of the processes of how repairs are being made and yeah. the sorts of equipment that are permitted. And You've got more of an eye on the historical side. Yeah, of it. yeah. And so I would be working, and as I did uh, at Knoll with Mola, we work really closely with Canterbury Archaeological Trust. So they are um, on site doing the recording of the exterior, the recording yeah. of the roof works, and all of the landscaping work as well. Yeah. I'm very conscious of the time. I have two quick questions and then we're done. All right. Okay. First one. Okay. Sight cat or sight dog? Sight cat. Oh, interesting. Any particular reason? I have a cat. Okay. <laughs> Do you know what? I'll be honest, that tends to be the reason. <laughs> but most people are like, my pet will be the sight yes, edible. my pet, yes. Uh, and the last one. You work in the heritage industry, but how would you like to be remembered? Ooh. I, uh, oh, God, I don't know. This is someone who was friendly and approachable, maybe, and who probably talked far too much about archaeology, <laughs> but that it was kind of interesting. I mean, I've got half a you know thought that in a hundred years' time someone's going to look and see Sid Doggett's name right underneath Nat Cohen. <laughs> no, I have been asked whether I've left my name anywhere, and I haven't. Um, yeah. But I have. One thing we did find at Knoll a lot when we were working in the roof spaces was uh, cigarette packets. Um, so a lot of people who who spent time uh, at Knoll have left their their names in uh, cigarette packets. So I will admit to having uh, left a. A tobacco packet with my business card in in our time capsule. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah. Nat, thank you very much for That's taking my the time. It's my pleasure. Thank you for asking me, Paul. No worries. Yeah. 
You've been listening to the Ask an Archaeologist podcast with me, Paul Duncan McGarrity. The music you were listening to was by From the Ashes. Check them out on Bandcamp. It was produced by me, Paul Duncan McGarrity. You can follow me on Twitter at Ask an Arc, or you can send an email at askanarch at gmail.com. But most importantly, if you've enjoyed yourself, you think you have a friend who might be interested in the podcast, please tell them about it. Write a review, put up a star rating, let people know that we're here. It's incredibly helpful and much appreciated. Once again, thank you to everyone who has asked an arc. Bye-bye.